got you help. <laughs> In writing Human Genetic Engineering, Pete Changs has truly performed a community service. I now feel equipped to read and understand newspaper articles, editorials, and even to have a conversation at the next cocktail party I find myself at about human genetic engineering. When was the last time you read a book that did that? I bet it's been a while. By the end of the book, it became clear to me that Pete Shanks, along with a huge majority of the American public, does not support human genetic engineering. He believes that it is too risky, too expensive, too full of class divides, and in the end, immoral. After the analysis of risk and reward that he provides, I'm inclined to agree with him. I think by the end of the evening, you will be too. And now I'm very pleased to present Pete Shanks. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Um, it's a great pleasure to be in a store where I've spent a lot of time over the years. Um, and I was figuring it out, probably more hours than dollars. It may not quite be the way that the store likes it, but um, I was doing important research. Anyway, um, tonight I'd like to talk a little bit about what got me interested in the issue of human genetic engineering. And so, what, you know, what the books intended to do, um, other than buy me a house in Santa Cruz, which I think it's probably won't. Um, and as I put together this, I'm going to read little excerpts from it. So rather than like reading a scene, which you do from a novel, I'm going to try and use the book the way I hope readers will use it, which is you take bits and pieces from here and there, depending on exactly what you're interested in at present. It's something that you can read straight through, I hope, or you can also dip into. So, first off, it's titled Human Genetic Engineering. Now, a lot of people focus on the last two words, genetic engineering, which sound rather difficult and scientific and esoteric and somewhat off-putting. I'd like to focus on the first one, human. It's really a book about people. And especially about who does what to whom. It's us. It's easy to forget that when you start talking about science or history or policy or any of the various abstract things that you bring up in a book. But I do want to put that as a big reminder right up front for all people and this is about us. Now, people are pretty complicated. <coughs> At least, people seem pretty complicated to me. People do horrible things, and people do wonderful things. And people laugh, and people frown, and people grieve, and people rejoice, and fall in love, and break each other's hearts, and help each other out, and all the things that, that people do. There's loads of stories about people. Endlessly fascinating, if you ask me, and there are enough stories to, well, fill a bookstore. <laughs> and have the stories left over. Again, that's, that's part of the context that, that we need to hold in mind, I think. But a little bit over five years ago, five and a half years ago, a good friend of mine who's here, but I haven't asked his permission to call him out, so I won't. Um, he can jump up if he wants started telling me about something that a friend of his had told him that I found really worrying. And that was that some apparently legitimate scientists, people at reputable universities and so on, were seriously planning to change people, to fix us in some way, to make us better, these quote marks I'm throwing up here, to improve people by making our children superhuman, or transhuman, or posthuman, there are various different you know, words about that. Well, this kind of fantasy has been around for a very long time. People had myths and so on. What's new is that just a few years ago, some of these scientists began to think that they had, or would soon would have, the tools to do it. They started doing things like holding conferences at UCLA to talk about it. That was 1998, was the big one. 
Uh, one of them, Professor Lee Silver of Princeton, wrote a book with the wonderful title, Remaking Eden. He was on it. I mean, you know, he knew what he was trying to do. In it, he envisaged a time when Homo sapiens, us, would split into two, or maybe even more, species, which he called the gen-rich and the naturals. Guess which ones he saw as being in charge? Guess which ones he identified with? Now that got my attention. Got my attention partly personal, because I'm British originally, as some of you may have noticed. And I came here to get away from the aristocracy. It's really, seriously, it's a good part of why I got away from Britain, the class system, the aristocracy, and so on. And here are apparently bright people with Nobel Prizes and stuff like that, talking about creating a genetic aristocracy. And I go, yikes, what is going on? Now, to talk about this stuff, I'm, you can do a lot of this discussion without technical terms, and I do my best to do it. But there are a couple that we do have to drag in here, because it comes up in other things we need to talk I, I want to quote and would like to talk about. And the term is germline, and that leads to the first of several short extracts from the book because we need to define our terms here a little bit. We need to nail it down. So this is from a section called Crossing the Germ Line. This is a distinction that's absolutely essential for understanding the controversies around human GE. Somatic cells are conceptually and practically different from germ cells. These are two kinds of cells in the human body. Germ cells are eggs, sperm, and the cells that make them. They pass on genes to offspring, and this shared lineage from parent to child is called the germline of the organism, or more broadly, of the species. The continuous inheritance from ancestor to descendant. Somatic, well, we're not going to use as much this evening, but let's it's, it's the other half, so to speak. Somatic comes from the Greek for body. And it may be used to contrast with either the psyche or with the germ cells, depending on context. In other words, sometimes people talk about what you're thinking, contrast it with somatic. In GE context, somatic interventions only affect one particular body. Now, I'll skip over a paragraph about haploid and diploid chromosomes, and I'll go read it later, it's your homework, it will be a quick. So a tattoo is a somatic alteration. So is bodybuilding. If you work out and increase your muscles, that makes no difference whatsoever to the genes you pass on to your children. If you were able to use gene doping, which is something I do talk about later on in the book, if it only affected your muscles, but it didn't affect your germ cells, that wouldn't affect your children either. That would not be crossing the germline. If, however, you doped your own germ cells, or more directly, the cells of a very early embryo during IVF treatment, that would affect the germline. It would affect your children and their children too. So in summary, Somatic genetic engineering affects some of the cells in a single body, but it's not passed on to future generations because it does not change the eggs and sperm. Germline genetic engineering does affect the eggs and sperm and is therefore passed on to future generations who carry the alterations in every single cell of their bodies. Every serious commentator and regulator considers the question of crossing the germline to be vitally important there are a few people who want to do it. Governments everywhere, including the US, have some kind of regulation against it. Some of those regulations are actually very weak. 